Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of March 13th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we look at what the spring revenue forecast due out this week is likely going to tell us about the state's current and future fiscal situation. Second, now that the Willow decisions are in hand, we look at what's ahead on the upstream project front that has even more importance to the state. And third, we discuss what we think some are missing in their analysis of why there's been a decline in the state's working age population over the past decade. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley, um, we're going to start things off here and uh, kind of kick things, uh, kind of kick things around. And the first thing that we need to talk about is the upcoming spring revenue forecast, which you are saying has definitely got some um, eye-opening things that are going to be coming through. Right? That's the that's the bottom line here. Give us uh, give us the intel on number one here. Well, to put things in context, every year the Department of Revenue issues two revenue forecasts. One is in the fall, which is their major forecast that they provide a lot of backup for and a lot of detail uh, uh, around. And that one is issued in connection with the fall with the governor's budget in December. It's prepared in October and November and issued uh, in December. And then once the session starts, uh, there's a second revenue forecast that they issue in the spring. Um, uh, that is an update, intended as an update to the fall forecast, doesn't have as much detail, but really sort of updates on the the, the oil trends and other trends that are going on uh, inside, uh, inside revenue uh, since the start of the session. And that one is typically issued March 15th, and March 15th is what? Tomorrow. So um, we're expecting, uh, uh, one of the things we're looking for this week certainly is the, is the spring revenue forecast. We do a lot of analysis during the course of the of the week and the month uh, on what's going on with oil prices and what's going on with volume production volumes and other things, and so we've got a pretty good insight uh, on where the what the spring revenue forecast is going to tell us, and it's not going to be great. Um, in the in the very immediate term, it's going to tell us that uh, 2023, the current fiscal year, is on track to come in. Uh, with the fall forecast, significantly down from last year's spring forecast, but to come in on track with the fall forecast. There's been a lot of concern about whether we're going to have to tap into the CBR. Um, uh, this legislature is going to have to tap into the CBR to fund the remainder of FY23. It looks like uh, from the from the, the prices that we see right now, from the futures prices we see right now for the rest of the, of the fiscal year, that we're going to just barely slide by uh, and, um, and and not have to tap into the CBR. But FY24 and beyond are looking materially worse uh, than, uh, than they did uh, in the fall revenue forecast. The fall revenue forecast projected uh, for FY24, the, the fiscal year that begins next July 1, this coming July 1, uh, projected uh, $81 a barrel. The current futures prices are telling us it's going to be more in the range of $75 a barrel. The year after that, FY25, uh, the fall revenue forecast projected $77 a barrel. The uh, current futures prices are telling us $71 a barrel. That translates into about $400 million or so um, uh, less revenue 
uh, for each of the of the near at least in the near term for each of the next uh, several years, uh, four hundred million dollars less revenue than was projected in the uh, in the fall uh, forecast. In the fall forecast for FY twenty four, for example, was seven hundred million down uh, from the previous uh, spring forecast. So over the course of from from last spring's forecast to this forecast. Uh, we're down a billion dollars uh, in oil revenue for FY24, the budget that we're looking at this year, and the and last 700 million for FY25 between last year's spring forecast and this spring forecast. Uh, but but the trends the trends are are coming in below. So when you when when you see headlines about you know Senate passes or Senate committee passes increased education spending, significant increase in education spe- education spending. I just sort of, you know, I blink my eyes in in amazement. I mean, we've got we've got spending trends that are going like this, and revenue trends that are that are that are going like that, without any discussion. Uh, I mean, the Senate's doing this without any discussion of what's going on on the revenue side. It's like it's like you know, revenue is infinite, and so we'll just keep spending because you know we don't have to worry about the revenue side, and that's just uh, that's just wrong. The other thing, the other thing that I'm going to be looking for in the spring forecast that I think is going to be a little bit lower, a little bit lower than what we saw in the fall forecast is production volumes. We're coming in below, not hugely, maybe 5%, but we're coming in below uh, on the production side uh, for FY23, unless there's some big change in the last uh, last few months of FY23, we're going to come in m- below. And I think that's indicative that some of our existing uh, uh, resources are producing less than what uh, than what the Department of Natural Resources, which does the production forecast, what they had estimated um, uh, last fall, and I expect that uh, that production trend to uh, to sort of carry through that lower production trend to uh, to carry through. That also will have a hit uh, to uh, uh, to revenues, not as huge as the price changes, because the price changes obviously apply to all the rev- all the production volumes across the across the line uh production volumes really have a much smaller drops in production volumes have a really much smaller impact on on revenue but for for people who think oh we're going to be saved by increased production volumes that ain't happening um uh, at least in the next the next few uh, uh fiscal years um if anything we're going to see a trend down uh sometimes in the spring revenue forecast they don't do a full remake uh, of the production volume, so they may just show this year down, and they may, you know, stick with the fall forecast for the remaining production volumes. But I think that we're down enough in this in, in this year that there ought to be a relook at what uh, at, at the factors they're using for future years. And if they do relook at it, I suspect that the that the the volumes are going to be down. The third component to look at is uh, the permanent fund corporation, the earnings. Uh, that's separate from the spring revenue forecast. They just pick up whatever the Permanent Fund Corporation is doing. Permanent Fund Corporation is showing some decline uh, from what they from what was used in the fall forecast, showing some decline from for permanent fund earnings revenues uh, from what was included in the fall forecast, um, and so that'll that'll have a downward impact also. So net net, uh, you know, the spring revenue forecast is is it's not me. The spring revenue forecast is going to be is going to be somewhat uh, depressing for those uh, for those who are concerned about how we're going to fund all, not only not only this increased spending, but how we're going to fund the base spending, the spending that right. you know is continuing on from year to year. They're, they're, we're, we're falling short of that, much less having having spare funds to uh, to fund the increase. So it's uh, you, it's not going to be a good situation. What do you think it's going to? I mean, you know, again, forget about the increase. What about just what the static uh, costs are? What kind of uh, what kind of damage do you think this is going to do to a potential deficit for twenty four? I mean, does it? Uh, how much does it increase that gap? Give me a give me a give me a feel here for how much it increases the gap. So four hundred million dollars. So we, we the, the projection last spring for for FY twenty four revenues was four point one billion dollars. Uh, the projection uh, last fall was three point four billion dollars, seven hundred million dollars down from that. What I think we're going to see the projection for FY24 that comes in now is about uh, three billion dollars on on traditional revenues, so the the oil and 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 other uh, uh, you know, existing fees and and, and uh, 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 taxes. So we're going to be about we're going to be about 
a billion one down. Uh, that's about a quarter. We're going to be about 25% down from last spring, uh, about $400 million uh, down from, uh, from last fall of what the projections were. That's, I mean, trends going down. <laughs> it's not, it's not going up. It's not funding increased spending anywhere. It's going down. So, right. and as you said, all the, all the spend side of it is all on the, uh, on the uh, upflow, everything's going up, 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 the hockey stick kind of thing on the other side. Michael, we, we've just had a complete disconnect. I mean, I, we, we've just totally disconnected spending from reality um, uh, in this state. I did a column, we did a column uh, for last Friday's landmine that looked at uh, spending under various scenarios, uh, resetting the baseline spending on, uh, on Senator Sedman's $1,300 PFD, Dan Ortiz's 2575, uh, Zach Fields $1,000 PFD. We looked at a, a number of scenarios uh, and reset the baseline and looked what that and and took a look at what that looked like going forward, and then took the difference the 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 deficit between what the current futures prices is telling are telling us and the permanent fund corporation are telling us about where revenues are going and the and 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 took the deficit between that and what these various uh, spending projections were. And then we did an analysis of where the PFD runs out, right? And the PFD runs out, uh, starts running out uh, under some of these scenarios in FY28, uh, uh, five years from now. Uh, runs out, not not down, runs out, zero. PFD's done uh, by FY28 on some of these scenarios. So we just, we, we have completely lost lock uh, on the connection between the spending side and the revenue side. I mean, I, the, the people who are talking about increased spending, I, I don't know. I don't know what they're thinking about other than, you know, revenues are somebody else's problem. I don't have to worry about those. I run the education committee. We're all about spending. So I get to spend a lot. So I'm going to spend even more and revenues. Hey, you know, we'll leave that to somebody else. I, there is nobody else. I mean, it's, there are no revenues, right? They're, right. they're going down. So long and the short of it is not good news for the spring revenue forecast, which is due to come out tomorrow. Uh, it will be shocking. So give me, lay me some odds here. Put the envelope to your head, Great Kreskin, and tell me what you think the reaction is going to be from all these big spending <laughs> folks here in the legislature. Are they going to look at it and just go, well, okay, somebody else's problem? Or is it, I mean, is anybody going to wake up? I don't know. You know, Ben Carpenter, I maybe the Ways and Means Committee. Well, we'll have some hearings on it. Maybe House Finance. Will have, I don't. I don't expect Senate Finance to do much about it. But maybe right. House Finance will have have some hearings on it on the disconnect between where we're going on the spending side uh, and on the revenue side. But it's, it's huge. I mean, to, for those interested, take a look at last uh, Friday's uh, Alaska landmine column, and you can see how huge those differences are, how fast they're growing, and what they're doing to the PFD. I mean, what's the reaction going to be? Well, Bert's going to say, well, maybe we can't afford a $1,300 PFD. Maybe it needs to be $1,100. And boy, isn't that good? $1,100. I mean, isn't that yeah. great? You know, compared to, shouldn't, compared shouldn't to the average. Shouldn't you be satisfied? Shouldn't you be satisfied? <laughs> it's, just, <You> know? <clears throat> it's just nuts. I mean, they're, they're, they're taking it out of middle and lower income Alaska families. They're taxing the hell out of middle and lower income Alaska families. And, and you know, and they're telling they're telling him it's good stuff. I mean, you should be happy. You should be happy that we're that we're only taxing you this much. That you get, you know, you get to get to keep this yeah. much of the PFD for now. Right. Uh, be satisfied, uh, peasants. Be satisfied with what we have given you. Uh, that's what it comes down to. I mean, here's the thing, Brad. Nothing. Nothing is. Nothing's going to change. Nothing's going to. They're going to see this and they're going to go well. Uh, Okay. And then they're just going to move on. Like you said, there's a total disconnect um, between the revenue and the expenditure side in this state. And quite honestly, I mean, first and foremost, this is the problem with building the entire economy on this total volatile, you know, commodity and market things going up and down and up and down between production and price, things beyond our control, like federal oversight and all these other things. And this is the, this is the problem. This is this is the problem right here. I just no, no, no. There's no connection to reality with what's going on in the state. There isn't. I, we may see a couple of stories. I, I I can hope we will see a couple of stories in the media about what the spring revenue forecast is going to be telling us about the 
about the drop in in prices, about the drop potential drop in production, about the about the you know the fact that we keep going down and down and down in terms of in terms of revenues, uh, and maybe we will get a couple of stories out of that. But you know, and then it'll just be overtaken again by we got to spend, we got to retain teachers, we got to have more you know more and more in the classroom. We got we got to have more and more and more. We got to have you know childcare, state funded childcare. We got to have you know the university. We got to have defined. Be- this is just nuts. This is just nuts. Uh, we don't have the revenue to support it. The only way we have the revenue to support it is by taking money out of the hands of middle and lower income Alaska families, disproportionately taxing them. Uh, that's the only way that, that that we're making it through. And we run out of that. Look at the, look at last Friday's column and you'll see we run out of that rapidly, the, the, the direction we're going. And it's just, you know, Kathy Giesel could care less about that. Bert Stedman, I think, could care less about that. Um, I don't know about Bryce and about Neil uh, over in House Finance. I haven't seen, you know, much evidence of what they're talking about and it, it, much concern about it in House Finance. Ben's concerned about it in ways and means, but there's only so much, you know, that 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 you can get across in ways and means, and the and the and the media is barely covering ways and means. So I, it's just nuts, Michael. I mean, right. We're, we're going to look back on this and fi- just like we're sitting here now looking back on the last decade and saying it was just nuts to drain every year to say, we're going to solve it. We're going to solve it next year. We're going to solve the spending problem next year. Uh, and, uh, and, and we're going to just drain savings a little bit more until it's gone. We're going to look back on this, you know, from the end of this decade and say, what the hell were we doing? What the hell were, you know, our leaders thinking uh, during this entire period when they kept spending and piling on more spending and piling on more spending? Just, it's just nuts. Well, Again, this is again that whole attitude of, well, who cares? The money is always there. I mean, I think Jeff Jeffrey says Jeffrey says I can't be out of money. I I still have checks, and then and then Tony says, well, the Alaska Legislature, I can't be out of money. I still have my credit cards. What are checks? I mean, that's the thing. They have no. It's just like. It don't matter. We'll, we'll we'll spend it. We got money somewhere. We'll find it. You. They don't it have. Out. Here's the thing. They don't have the money. It's middle and lower income Alaska families. It's 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 the inheritance. It's the heritage. Oh come that on, Brad! That's, set up for middle and lower income Alaska families. But that's not your money. That's still their money. That's still their money, right? Because Bill Walker said it's still your money. Bill Walker said, "Well, this is revenue. This is state revenue. This is not. This is not the people. I know what they said, and I know what they said that they should have first call, and I know that that's the people. But no, no, that's that's government revenue. So again." They'll suck up all the available revenue in the in the in the room. And then <clears throat> I guarantee you in 2028, if the world hasn't tilted off its axis and fallen into the sun by 2028, that we'll be having this conversation again. And now it will be they've sucked up every available dollar. And now they'll be coming back to you saying, well, you know, you Alaskans, you really should pay your fair share. You know, you're not paying your fair share. No other state in the, you are the only state that doesn't have some form of tax. So <laughs> we, you should really pay, you know, they'll shame you. They'll look you in the eye and say, you know, you really should pay your fair share for state government. And you know, Michael, what, what they're going to start in on is they're going to start in on sales taxes, which are the most regressive form of tax other than PFD cuts, which are the most regressive form of tax in the nation. They'll start in on sales tax and say, oh, you know, it, it, it'll be it'll be, you know, shove it to the middle and lower income Alaska families again. Look, you know, I'm in the top 20 percent. I'll be fine. Me personally. But the Alaska economy and Alaska families, 80 percent of Alaska families will be worse off. The Alaska economy will be worse off. The nest egg, the promise, the inheritance that we said we were setting aside for middle and lower income, primarily for middle and low, lower income Alaska families, that'll be gone. Right. It'll it'll be I mean, well, and by then, too, it'll be too big to fail. Right. Because now they will have instituted all these new plans and programs and spending. And now they'll say, <clears throat> oh, well, we can't possibly cut that out now because people are dependent on it. So now we we can't go backwards now. It'll be tougher to cut then than it is to you think it's tough to cut right now. You wait till they add even more spending on you wait till they add all these extra things on. <laughs> Then it'll become damn near impossible. The constituencies, the additional constituencies they add, that's what's going yeah. on. That's uh, somebody mentioned the Bastiat and the buying from the public treasury. And this is exactly this is exactly what we're talking about. All right, Brad, give me a tease for number two here. 
Well, number two is we're going to talk a little bit about Willow. There's been a lot written about Willow in the last couple of days. There'll be a lot written about Willow in, uh, uh, in the coming future, but we're going to sort of look beyond Willow. We're going to take today's events and then sort of look beyond and, and, and see what, uh, what the next thing up that's, uh, that's important from an Alaska perspective. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, number two of the weekly top three. Brad should really tell us how he feels. I mean, we got him all worked up during the commercial break. <laughs> uh, and now we've got Willow, right, which is going to save us all. Willow's going to – oh, maybe not. Um, Willow. Uh, I mean, it's been greenlit, right, but it's the two-edged sword. So they give Willow on three different uh, areas instead of the five or seven that they originally had talked about. And on top of that, they carved out, <clears throat> was it 16 million acres out of NPRA, three millions completely off limits, uh, some areas that are pretty viable, completely off limits and severe restrictions on another 13 million acres uh, to try and appease all the green weenies out there. Uh, and of course, it doesn't really matter because not a lot of that money comes to Alaska anyway, but this could be the last great oil development in Alaska. I mean, if if the ESG folks get their way, et cetera, what, what do you say? What's coming up with Willow? What are the ramifications? So Willow, Willow is important. Willow is important, as we've talked about on the show before. It's important from a contractor standpoint, from an employment standpoint. We'll talk a little bit about that more in the third segment, but but it's important. It's it's important from a from an economy standpoint because it will employ a lot of people. It will have a lot of contracts. There'll be a lot of activity up there, and it'll be good from the standpoint of of a construction project that will generate generate a lot of benefit for the for the state's economy. Uh, not not it won't generate much revenue for government. In fact, it for the first few years it takes money away from government because of the way our tax code works. Uh, but it will it will generate generate a lot of activity for the economy. The, the, the restrictions that, that Biden put on uh, NPRA and on the, the ocean are concerning, but not really. I mean, we sort of bounce back and forth. We have a Republican administration or we have a Democrat administration. They put a bunch of restrictions on. We have a Republican administration. They take the restrictions off. We have a Democrat administration. They put the restrictions back on. I'm not, I'm not going to worry too much about the, about the restrictions that are put on the remainder of NPRA. I've but seen that, that before. But that does have an effect on the investment side of things, right? Because then the companies are like, well, it's open right now, but what happens in 36 months when the White House changes? I mean, it really throws up some uncertainty there, right? It does have an effect, the, the wiffle ball back and forth. It does have an effect, Michael, and, and, and I don't mean to belittle that, but but we've, we're doing Willow, and Willow's an NPRA. Um, and so, and so Grant, you know, when you find a good project and you find uh, a good basis for the project and you keep can keep the pads small. Uh, there, there is a justification for going forward. Now, you know, we may not be doing much more exploration out of NPRA. We've done some. There are some fines out there. Uh, maybe people will want to develop them, and maybe we'll have to wait for a Republican administration to push those along. But it's not. That's not. I. That's not where the storyline is on what on what's important to Alaska, because even if those are developed, it's another willow. It's another federal lands. It's another case where the royalty goes to. Is split between the federal government and the and the communities, uh, uh, the affected communities. It doesn't go to the state, um, and it's another situation in which actually our our, our revenue. It's another situation in which actually our revenue would go down for a while because of the way that the that the oil taxes work. They would take the construction costs as a credit against the production tax uh, while they're while they're in the construction phase of the project. So, it those those projects the 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 additional restrictions that that Biden's put on really are not are not that big a concern to me. The next big thing up and the thing that Alaskans now need to turn their focus to because it means two things. It means both jobs and, and contracts, just like Willow does, but it also means state revenues, uh, bigger state revenues because because of royalty, because the royalty would come to the state, is the PICA project. And the and the and the and and we hope uh, we hope that Willow is not the last great project. It may be, it may turn out to be the last great project on federal lands, but PICA is a big, important project now on state lands. And we need to turn our attention to supporting uh, PICA as much as the, as, as much effort as went into supporting Willow um, and ConocoPhillips and the contractors and everybody else who, who, who think they're going to make a lot of money off Willow. We now need to turn the same attention to PICA and be as supportive as PICA. PICA has the benefit 
that it's on state lands instead of federal lands. So it doesn't need as many federal permits um, as uh, as Willow does. Doesn't need as many uh, environmental approvals and as many uh, 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 permits from the federal government as as Willow does. But it's going to need some. And and we need to be as supportive as, of the PICA project now, Oil Searches, Santos's uh, PICA project, uh, as we ever were of the Willow project, because that PICA is going to make a difference. It's, it's going to move the needle in terms of state revenues uh, uh, going forward. Um, and and that's the one. That's the one that that the really now that Willow's done. Now that now that everybody's. You know, said their said their great things about Willow and passed their resolutions and gone to D.C. and you know done all their lobbying. Now the attention needs to turn to PICA, and it needs to be as supportive as P- of PICA as it ever was of uh, of Willow. What do you think of the? Ch- I mean, now uh, I saw some commentary. I think it was yesterday that said, "Well, Willow's been passed now, but." Now the litigation phase opens up, right? Now it's going to be, I mean, there's still no guarantee that this thing is starts this year, next year. I mean, it could be, we could be stuck in all these things for the future because there's no, there's no end to the, uh, to the environmental side of this, the ESG side, they're going to be pushing hard on this. They are. Uh, Conoco said a good thing. Um, Conoco said that they're going to go ahead and start the pads, start the gravel work uh, immediately. Uh, this season, uh, with uh, with the environmental approvals from uh, uh, from the from the administration, from the Biden administration, and that's that's a good sign. They didn't say anything about holding it up, waiting on litigation. There will be litigation, but but one thing about <laughs> Democrats do some things better than Republicans. One thing Democrats do is they do they do approvals better than Republicans. They tend to dot the i's and cross the t's better than Republicans do. One of the problems with Willow was it was done during the Trump administration, not good, bad, or indifferent, but they just sort of, they sort of rocket, they sort of rocketed to the end, approved, uh, without really dotting the I's and crossing the T's as they went, as they went through the process. Democrats are much better, Democratic administrations are much better about dotting I's and crossing T's. So I, I have a, I have a much better feeling about this approval process and its ability to withstand litigation, uh, than, than, one should have had uh, with the with the Trump approval, Trump administration's approval, um, and I think I think Conoco is signaling the same thing. I think Conoco is signaling that with their discussion of going forward with the gravel work, I think they're signaling that they have a much better feeling about the uh, about the the potential for approval than uh, uh, than than they did during the Trump administration. We'll we'll see. I mean, the the environmental groups will go into court quickly. They'll try to get an injunction against it. Uh, they'll try to. Uh, uh, try to, you know, scream bloody murder that the administration didn't do a good job on the environmental review, didn't do, didn't adequately consider this, that, or the other thing. We'll see how the courts treat that. But I think, I think, I think we've seen a much better process, a much better dotting of I's and crossing of T's this time. Um, You know, and let's for a second, just talk about you and I have talked about this in the past, what Willow really means for the state. Again, this is more about an economic boom um, on the job side, on the construction side, it's a short lived boom in that regard, you know, for the build up and everything else. But overall, I mean, we're talking about, uh, what is it? Three, $4 billion, but that's over the course of years, right? This is not just like, we're going to immediately see half a billion dollars a year going into the kitty every year. This is a, this is a, a smaller gain over a much longer term. Actually, we see, actually, we see revenues go down for a while because during the construction phase, as I, as I mentioned, the way our tax code works, uh, they get to the oil companies get to expense uh, construction costs, um, uh, regardless. I mean, as long as it's within lands that are subject to production tax, they get to expense expense the production costs against the uh, against the tax. So we'll see revenues go down for a while from where they otherwise would have been. We'll see go, revenues go down for a while as Conoco takes uh, the, the the expenses of constructing Willow as a as an offset uh, to their tax obligation. It'll it'll come back uh, once Willow gets into production, and once we get through the, the the tax holiday for for new production, it'll come back. But that's that's outside the ten year period before we see that coming back. Um, so it's it's a long way off. It's not a lot of dollars because the royalty dollars all go to the feds, are all distributed by the feds. Uh, it's it's a long time off before we see any revenues of the state. Peak, on the other hand, 
Pika does go through the same thing of, of a reduction in, in production tax, but Santos isn't paying much production tax. So it's really not a reduction from, from what we've seen from, from the, from the revenues that we've seen uh, or revenues will be, we will be seeing. Uh, there is the tax holiday once they get production up and running, but that's only for a, a period of time. And we get the royalties during the entire time it's producing. There's not a holiday on royalties. The royalties begin immediately. Right. Um, so it's so it, Pika is a much, much, much more significant boom. Uh, not boom. It's a much more significant revenue source uh, for the state than uh, than Willow will ever be. So Willow, again, uh, just to break it down like I'm five here because we're coming up to the end. Um, but basically, Willow, short term gain in the economy, construction, employment, things like that but long, long tail outside the 10-year window before we actually start to see revenues from it. PICA is the immediacy, and that's... And where is PICA in the process here? we got about two minutes here. PICA, I think I think they're now projecting a 25, 2025 or a 2026 startup, uh, if I recall correctly. It's coming in phases. The first phase is 80,000 barrels a day, maybe. Maybe my memory's off a little bit on that, but... Um, it's a it's a fairly near term startup. It's a fairly significant volume in the near term. You can see the bump in the production forecast. You can see that bump like in 26 or 27, uh, if I recall correctly. So it's 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 coming. It's co it's going to come on faster uh, than Willow does. And as I say, because of the royalty side, tax side will be delayed. But because of the royalty side, we'll see a bump in revenues much more quickly. And approvals are all good. I mean, we're still working through any of those processes. I mean, again, the, the federal government could be involved in the FERC and I mean, everything else. So what, no, what, not, I'm, I'm not, not FERC. FERC on that because it's not transported. So, but I mean, what, you know, what, what are the, what are the roadblocks that we have on it? Well, we got a, we got a few roadblocks. We got, we got a few federal approvals yet, but they're not major. They, they shouldn't be, they shouldn't be holdups. If they, you know, if the federal government wanted to make them major, they probably could, but they shouldn't be. They should be traditional approvals uh, of very of, of relatively small steps, relatively incremental steps, um, and uh, and we should be uh, should be okay with those approvals. But we need the same sort of focus on getting those approvals done. We need this, the, the same sort of support of getting those approvals done and getting the state approvals done uh, and getting the process done as the same sort of focus on that as we've had on Willow. Much more important. From a state revenue standpoint, and as we've talked about in the first segment, we need a focus on the state revenue standpoint, much more important from a state revenue standpoint than uh, than Willow will ever be. And certainly much more important from a state revenue standpoint in the near term uh, than Willow will be. I didn't mean to stretch this out too much, but I mean, I think this is important uh, between the first, se the first number one and number two. Those two things are really, again, dependent, codependent on each other especially for the long term with PICA and everything else and those revenues. Uh, but again, if we don't fix all the problems that are in number one, which is this complete disconnect, this complete lack of empathy for where does the money come from, um, we could have three PICAs on the horizon and it wouldn't matter because at this point they would consume everything in the room. They're like locusts at this point. It is. I mean, we, part of what's going on here. I mean, remember last year, last year, FY23, we can't, we can't possibly spend any more than we spend in FY23. We funded all these capital projects. We've made good on all these, on all these past obligations, all this one time spending. We can't possibly spend any more than we spent, uh, than we spent in FY23. Well, <laughs> Bert Stedman's $1,300. Um, uh, PFD, Dan Ortiz's 2575 PFD and Zach Fields thousand dollar PFD. They do spend more when you, when you calculate what the, what the, uh, uh, amount that shifted to revenue out of the permanent fund earnings, when you calculate what's needed for those PFDs, and then you calculate the remainder that shifted over to revenue, they're spending more, um, uh, 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 uh in, in those three scenarios, the thirteen hundred dollar PFD, the thousand dollar PFD, and twenty five seventy five, they're spending more than we spent uh, than we spent last year. And there's no, there's, you know, you read the press. I know that Ben. I know that I know that that uh, the Republican side of the House is trying to, you know, sound the alarm for what's going on here. 
but there's nothing in the press about about you know we're 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 way the hell no we're way way no. the hell beyond where we where we where we were in 23. No, it's it's the, the complicity of the news media at this point, basically just taking the talking points from the powers that be and just saying, oh, look at all the great things that are going on and look at what's happening. How could you, House Republicans, stand in the way of such greatness, such great ideas uh, as this and thing? Don't you care about the children and everything else? I mean, and the, I mean, even the even the snickering about, oh, well, you want an accountability component in this? I mean, come on. Nobody needs an accountability component. We haven't taken care of the children. Don't you know? I mean, there is no other side of the argument in any of the reporting on this in the state. of. It's like I was talking about earlier. It's all coming out of it looks like now it's now all coming out of one news source and everybody's just reprinting the same news stories over and over. It's it's crazy. There is no accurate thought or analysis on this kind of uh, on this kind of stuff. We're going to have a test. We're going to have a test when the spring revenue forecast comes out tomorrow. uh, If it's if it's on track uh, on schedule, we're going to have a test about about how the legislature treats the spring revenue forecast and how the media treats the spring revenue forecast. If I were, if I were in the legislature and everybody knows I never will be because I would never be elected, but if I were in the state legislature, I would hold hearings on the state's revenue situation using the spring revenue forecast as a trigger and, 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 and show those graphs, show those lines with revenue going down, show those graphs with, with deficits growing exponentially at, at, at various spending levels and have two or three days of hearings just focused on revenue and on the deficit picture that that, that revenue is creating and see if the media uh, picks up on that. That's what it's going uh, to take to identify uh, and, and, to, and, to, and, to, and, to, and to make people realize the 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 challenge that we've got uh, from a revenue standpoint. Donna says Brad's latest piece shows something important that cutting the dividend does not contribute to the to budget balance. When the PFT money gets spent by the government, government spend grows faster than any revenue. Again, the one thing we've been talking about with people like Rob Myers and stuff is that disconnect between the private and the public economy. When they have access to all that money. Well, I don't care what's going on in the private economy, right? I got, I got all the money in the world, and when when that permanent fund hits a hundred billion dollars, we'll have all the money we need and and piss on the private economy. It doesn't matter. They've outspent that. I mean, the hundred billion dollar people, assuming a five percent or take, that's five that's five billion dollars. That's 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 what they that's what they've said is nirvana for revenue, right? We're beyond that. I mean, if you look at if you look at the at the spending numbers that we've got in last Friday's column. We're way the hell beyond that. Uh, uh, even even you know the 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 proposals that are less than uh, the thirteen hundred dollars or the twenty five seventy five or the thousand dollar PFD. We're way beyond that uh, in ten years. So it's not. We, we're just we, we've lost we've lost total track of 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 the relationship between revenues and spending and what our revenues are. I mean, it's just it's like. It, it's like it's like a it's like it's like we become the federal government, right? The federal government, you know, really doesn't pay much attention to revenues. They just keep spending and spending and spending. <laughs> uh, but but they can finance it with debt, right? They can finance right. it by by just issuing by just issuing government bonds. We can't do that. We need to keep track of where revenues are, uh, and and have some tie between that and spending. And we just we just aren't. And the spending caps we've we've talked about. I mean. James Kaufman, good for him. Will Stapp, good for them for you know having for talking about a spending cap. But those aren't attached to revenues; those are attached to something that you know sort of floats through the universe, uh, 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 GDP, your gross state product. Um, those aren't attached to revenue. So I, you know, we, we we have we have totally disconnected this government. We're we're in the process of totally disconnecting this government from spending and revenues. And, you know, a lot of people say that government isn't like your, isn't like your personal bank. You can't make analogies of your family uh, economics to government. Well, you know, I can't make one analogy when I don't have any money in my checking account, when the credit cards are tapped out, I'm done. I can't yeah. spend any more. Exactly. And that's going to be the same way with this government. And we're rapidly going there. You can't 
beat arithmetic is what we're trying to say. Can you give us a quick 30 second tease on number three here? So number three is, is this recent report from uh, uh, Department of Labor, Alaska Department of Labor, uh, about uh, analyzing Alaska's working age population and the decline in the working age population since 2013. There's a, there's a, there's a connection there that, that isn't made in any of these articles, but I think is probably the determinative connection. Um, and we need to talk about what really does drive Alaska's working age uh, population, because a lot of people are attributing it to not enough spending on education, not enough spending on the university, right. not enough spending on child care. I don't think that's it. All and, right. Uh, and we need to talk about the reasons. This third problem that you're talking about, which is the decline, the the outflow, the exodus of working age Alaskans, which has been covered in a couple different articles with the new reports coming out from the Department of Labor. But you said there's something that all these articles are missing. Uh, there's a corollary that they're not seeing. So set us up for it and knock it down. So the setup is, is that the Department of Labor uh, came out with a uh, an article about the decline in Alaska's workforce population since 2013. Big article, uh, important article, big uh, trend, important important trend. And a lot of people are trying to make different things off of it. Those who want to increase government spending for K through 12, for child care, for the university, for you know, you name it, uh, they're all picking up on this on this statistic and they're saying, oh well. The reason for the decline is we haven't had an investment in K through 12. The reason for the dis the decline is we haven't had an investment in child care, state investment in child care. The reason for the decline is because the universities have had have had problems. The reason for the decline is we haven't spent enough government money. That's yeah, the reason for decline. Exactly. And goes on and on and on. But here's the thing people are missing. When was the last great investment rush on the North Slope? When did it end? 2013. What was it? Point Thompson. What was going on before then? Well, we had Kaparik, we had Alpine, we had, we had, you know, Prudhoe with the, with the, the satellites being built out. The last one in that string was Point Thompson. That was that, and that came to a head, big head, a lot of construction, a lot of activity, a lot of contracts, a lot of people up there in 2013. Some from out of state, but a lot of in-state contracts. And what happens when you have a big construction contract like that, a big oil field construction contract like that? Well, a lot of people have money. They spend it on restaurants. They spend it on small businesses. They spend it on, you know, holidays. They depend. They spend it all over the all over the state. A lot out of the state, but also a lot a lot in the state. What have we not had since 2013? We haven't had big oil field construction projects. We've had we've had sort of coming off the, the coming off the peaks. We've had we've just sort of you know ramped everything down. There was supposed to be more construction at Point Thompson uh, as as that as they ramped up the oil side. That never happened, uh, and so we have Point Thompson sort of sort of coming off the peak. Kaparik off the peak. Alpine off the peak. Point Thompson or uh, uh, Prudhoe uh, off the peak. All of those fields are are coming off the peak. And through the through the mid you know if you look at the university, if you look at K through 12, they're all good until about 2016. But but what's really going on from 2013 on is we haven't had oil field construction projects. And none of these articles have really made the connection. I mean, all of them, everybody just immediately wants to spin it their own way. You know, oh, K through 12 has gotten bad or, or university's gotten bad or something else has gotten bad. But that's not what real, what's really going on. What's really going on in terms of the workforce population is we've not have had any big oil field construction projects. Now we're going to have Willow, hopefully, and Willow's going to start to ramp up. It's going to be slow at first, and then it's going to be you know major construction. And I and I'm going to suggest that we're going to see the workforce, the 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 working age population start to increase, not back to the peaks that we had, you know, 2013 and prior when we had all sorts of construction going on, oil field construction going on. But we're going to see it building back up as as Willow comes up. And if Pika goes forward, we're going to see some building back up as, as, as Pika goes forward. That's what drives the working age population in this state. Not, I mean, K through 12 is nice. University is nice. Child care, God only knows. But, but all of that stuff is, is, additive at the margin, but
But that's not what drives the population. What drives the population is big jobs, and big jobs in this state are driven by big oil field uh, construction projects, not big oil fields, because once you get an oil field constructed, you can run it with a fairly small workforce. And then as it starts declining, sometimes you got to add people to get more out of it, uh, to get more, to drill more wells and get more out of it, but not much. What really drives it is big oil field construction. And, and we haven't had that since 2013. We're going to have it again. So, you know, people are trying to describe, trying to ascribe a lot of reasons to this phenomena of the decline in, 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 in working age population and trying to fashion a lot of government spend remedies to, 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 to respond to it. Those are not going to move the needle. What's going to move the needle needle is Willow and, um, and, and Pika. And that's just, that's just the state. Uh, that's just the state we're in. That's just what our economy responds right. to. And you're not, and, not you're not saying that, of course, all those jobs and the eco- economic growth will all come specifically, strictly from the Willow, the Picas, the new projects. There's also the trickle down effect of those people having money and coming back into the economy and wanting to spend it. And there's that again, the ripple effect of the dollars, the dollars in the private. So where we talk about dollars turning in the private sector five, six, seven times, that's because there will be other things that will benefit from that that part of the spending, the private spending. Right, exactly right, and it's important that these are in-state jobs to the to the maximum extent we we possibly can do it. It's important that these are in-state jobs because it's not going to do us any good if we've got a bunch of people parachuting in from Oklahoma and Texas and Louisiana and New Mexico and Kansas and wherever they come from, you know, flying up on planes, working the project, then getting on planes and flying back home and spending that money back home. It's not going to help us if if that's what's going on. It's got to it's got to come from buildup of in-state jobs, in-state contracts, in-state uh, employment. That's that's the that's the key to it. Taking advantage of it, and you know, <laughs> these are going to be big jobs. They're going to be they're going to last for a while, but they're not going to last forever. And so, convincing people in their minds to come on up here, to move up here, to have their families up here, to be able to support those jobs without without the the sense that there's something beyond that, there's additional projects beyond that, may be a challenge. But you know that's what's that's what's going to drive that's what drives employment. That's what drives working age employment in this state. And 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 and, and there's there's two important things out of this. One to understand what does drive it, and it's oil field construction, and to understand what doesn't drive it, and that's K through twelve university. And uh, and and other spending improves quality of life at the margin, maybe, uh, but it doesn't drive jobs. We're not going to by having additional state spending as much as people will will claim otherwise by having additional state spending on K through 12 on on the university, on child care and other stuff. We're not going to have a huge bump in working age employment. What's going to bring working age employment is is high is 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 good paying solid jobs uh, up on the slope. So what you're saying is the private industry and the private sector creates wealth and jobs for the long term and government doesn't, which is exactly the opposite of what we continue to hear out of Juneau and Washington and other places where the government has got to drive the economy. It's a complete philosophical change and a difference. Donna Ardwin says people tend to move where there are jobs and opportunities and the state government isn't a mess. That's the problem. We've got a state government that's a mess. We don't have the opportunity and the jobs until these projects and things like that come online. But in, in, we've got to get the state government out of the mess you know, side of the equation as well, because like you said, what, that's all they see. They see the only way to move it forward is by more government spend. We just haven't spent enough. Yep. Well, yeah. And, and, and during the 20 teens, I mean, from 2013 to 20 to, to currently 2023, We've had a decline in working age because we haven't had the attractiveness of North Slope jobs and there have been jobs in the lower 48. So if you got a job in the lower 48 and you don't have a job here, or if you got a better paying job in the lower 48 and you don't have a job here, you're going to be attracted to the lower 48, even if they have taxes. My God, even right. if they have state sales taxes or state income taxes, you're going to be attracted to the lower, <coughs> excuse me, to the lower 48 because they've got jobs. So what we, we, I mean, so what we need to have up here is jobs. We need to have, 
We need to have projects. We need that's what drives this state. Um, and and hopefully Willow's going to add to that, and hopefully Peak is going to come behind uh, and add even more to that. And if we can find have more discoveries on state land, then then maybe we'll have a, we'll have a, another period uh, uh, beyond that. But but that's what that's what really drives jobs. And 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 we shouldn't we shouldn't be falling for the argument that that it's k through 12 that it's state spending that's gonna that's gonna save the jobs market that's not that really has very very little to do with it all right brad let's wrap it up one two and three give us your final thoughts here on kind of the combination of the three and how they all tie together well one is one is uh the spring revenue forecast is not going to be pretty uh revenues are going down uh we have a huge disconnect between state spending which is going up um, all you have to do is read the newspaper, state spending going up, uh, and state revenues going down. And what's the, what's the squeeze, what's going on in the middle, middle and lower income Alaska families are going to lose a lot, uh, as, as, uh, the government takes taxes them more and more by taking it, taking it out of the PFT. Uh, number two is, uh, Willow's important. Willow's great. Thank you for all of the efforts on Willow. Uh, it's going to be an important in, in, an important component going forward, as we just talked about from a job standpoint. But from a government revenue standpoint, it's not that big a deal. Uh, actually, it costs money, costs the state money in the near term. Uh, it makes it back ultimately over the longer term, but it's not much, and it, and it takes a long time to get it back. The real important project is PICA. Uh, that's what's really going to drive the state revenues. Uh, because it's on state lands and we get state royalties uh, uh, from uh, from the PICA development in addition to production taxes. And so uh, uh, PICA, now that we've done now that we've done Willow, everybody needs to congratulate themselves, pat themselves on the back and now double down on pushing forward on getting the approvals necessary to to bring PICA forward because that's much more important to the state. And the third is we need both these projects because that's what drives jobs. If you look at if you look at the at the correlation between industry investment and 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 working families, how many working families, working age families we've got uh, in the state, uh, it goes up when we when we've got oil field construction. It goes down when we don't have oil field construction. We're going to come back into a period where we're going up with Willow and hopefully Pika. Uh, that's a good thing, but we shouldn't tie we shouldn't tie this 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 lag in working age construction to things like K through 12 and, and, and the university and, and childcare and other things. Those are marginal things that improve quality of life, but those are not things that bring people that will bring people up here in the, in the types of volume uh, that we need to replace the uh, decline we've had in uh, working age families. The problem is Brad, we haven't spent enough government money. I mean, <laughs> $16,000 for every man, woman, and child in the state, and we still haven't spent enough. We don't have it, Michael. We don't have the revenues. I, I just, I, you know, I mean, how much, if you're spending 16000 you know, for a household of four, if you're spending, you know, 60 dollars on state government for a household of four, and what are they really seeing? If that's not enough, what is it? Is it eighty thousand? Is it a hundred thousand dollars for a family of four? I mean, what is the magical number that you can't just you know you can't? It's a zero sum game. You can't just pour more money that you don't have into an empty bucket and expect it to fill up. It's got a hole in the bottom of it. You you can't do it. Government is a net consumer. It's not a producer, and they just can't figure that out. Yeah, it's um, uh, we're 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 coming we're coming to the we're, we're coming to the come to Jesus moment. I mean. We, we ran through savings in the 20 teens. We're now running through the PFD. We're now taxing the hell out of middle and lower income Alaska families by taking it out of the PFD through the 20, through the 2020s. And we're going to run out of it here, not in, in the not too distant future. And what happens then? I mean, we've built up this huge, we build up this huge state bureaucracy. We've got all these constituent groups that live off of, off of the state bureaucracy, live off these state dollars. And we will run out of the dollars. So what, what happens then? I mean, I we're, we're heading, we're heading. We we had one fiscal cliff in the early 20 teens when we when we ran beyond our traditional revenues. Right. And we and we and it was like the roadrunner, right? We ran off the cliff. And then we said, Oh, we'll just use savings. I mean, we'll we'll, we'll bolster it with savings. We told ourselves every year we were gonna we we're gonna bring spending down, but it never happened. And we're just we're not we're gonna we're gonna, you know. We're going to make the roadrunner okay by just bringing up savings. 
Then the Roadrunner runs off the cliff. Then we run out of savings in the in the late 20 teens. Um, and, and the Roadrunner's running off the cliff again. Now we're going to tax middle and lower income Alaska families. Now we're going to take money that's promised them, inheritance that's promised them under state statute. We're just going to ignore the state statute. We're going to take that money and we're going to keep the Roadrunner going. And in fact, the Roadrunner is just going to keep going higher and higher and higher. And, 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 and in the middle 2020s to the late 2020s, we're going to run out of that. We're going to run out of the ability to tax middle and lower income Alaska families. We're going to take all their inheritance. We're going to take all their, all the money that, that, that Hammond set aside to, to, you know, to flow through to, mid, to the benefit of middle and lower income, low, middle and lower income Alaska families. We're going to take all of that. Um, and then where's the road runner going to go? And I, you know, at that point, I truly think we're off the cliff because right. I, because there's just no place to go, but we build up all these constituencies in the meantime, government, all, these, ed- all, all right. these education, all these college constituencies in the meantime. Yeah. The dependency state, we have become the dependency state where we've created our own problem. Uh, and eventually everybody will cry out in pain because we just, Oh, we, we can't stop the spend. I mean, you think it's, like I said earlier, you think it's tough to stop state state spending now, wait till they consume all of the PFD. And then they start talking about people start clamoring for cuts and then it'll be, well, we can't do that. People are dependent on it. You'll, you'll crash the economy. People will be unemployed. You can't do that. Uh, I could see the handwriting on the wall already. I could see it coming. It's going to be, it's going to be painful. But you, uh, you can't, you can't see it coming by reading the, the ADN or the beacon no, or anything else. And no. you can't see it coming by listening to, listening to the, to the most of the hearings uh, that are going on in the legislature these days, particularly on the Senate side. Yeah. I mean, no, no, you, it's, it's pie in the sky. It's in the Senate side. We've got to, it's our, it's our God given responsibility to spend this money that we don't have. <laughs> to keep you protected and bolstered and everything else. And you should be, you little child, you should be happy with what we give you in the end. That's what it's all about. It's, it's insane. It is insanity. All right. Well, Brad, Hey, thanks for all the positivity. Appreciate that. <laughs> That's what Chris is for. That's why we're bringing Chris on because man, I am bleeding from every orifice right now. Wait, just blood dripping from my eye right now, waiting to, to feel the pain. But thanks for bringing it out, Brad. I appreciate you coming on board and joining us. Um, we'll we'll see where it goes from here. We'll see where it goes. Thanks so much for uh, coming on board and being a part of it today. Thanks for having me, Michael. Uh, as always, great stuff. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.